Welcome back guys to another episode of the Health Mastery Show. I am your host, as always, Adam MacDonald. And on today's episode, I have with me Marty Kendall. We spoke in episode 3, and this is episode 23, so 20 episodes later and about 8 months later. It's great to talk to Marty again. In the first episode, we talked all about optimizing your nutrition. If you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to that. But in this episode, we talk specifically around setting up your nutrition for fat loss. So what specific foods or food properties should you look for when you're actually trying to lose body fat? So I hope you enjoy this episode. If you do like it, please leave a comment. Please share on your Instagram stories and your Facebook. Send to a friend. Somebody who's going to value it. And if you want to learn more about Marty, you'll find all his contact details and all the things that he offers in the show notes. So without further ado, let's get into this episode with Marty Kendall. So Marty, thanks for joining the podcast once again. Yeah, great to be back, man. Yeah, it's been a while. I think we just said there it was, uh, I think July or so, yeah. or so, maybe even slightly earlier that we first talked. Um, it was episode three. We we talked about all all around optimizing nutrition, yeah. and uh, and now I think this is this could be episode twenty three. So twenty episodes later. Um, <laughs> About eight months later, but uh, yeah, I've loved yeah, it's, it's, listening it's, to the podcast, and it's been great. Yeah, it's 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 been great uh, to catch up once again, man. So for those who haven't listened to episode number three yet, I, I suggest they go back and do that. But um, if, if you haven't listened to that, could you explain to the guys or the people listening who, who exactly you are, what do you do? Uh, yeah, um, my name's Marty Kendall. Uh, I suppose I started into this um, by day. I'm an engineer, so I think with numbers and spreadsheets. And my wife is a type one diabetic, so I suppose it was a, um, a a challenge to say how do we dial in nutrition to initially manage insulin and blood sugars and stabilize that, but also just taking that journey and finding myself needing to dial in my own nutrition to manage my own weight and just trying to be a um, to get strong like you guys and all, all these amazing people I met who are bodybuilders and trying to get lean and trying to follow that journey and do it for myself and uh, just, just no, noticing that there's so many different requirements in nutrition. Some people want to get lean, some people want to get strong, some people need to balance their blood sugars, some people are just happy with where they're at and happy to um, optimize their nutrition for a long and healthy life. So I suppose I've tried to dial in nutrition quantitatively to find the right dietary approach for all those different people and and at the center of everything is is micronutrient density which seems to everything else seems to flow from that but nobody's talking about it so i i keep talking about it and some people keep listening and uh, the journey continues so yeah, it's been a, been a riot to get to talk to amazing people all over the place about it yeah that, that's awesome and uh, when we did initially talk about that before I th- I'm not not exactly sure how many kind of weeks I was out from my first competition that I that I done, but um, I was in a very low body fat state. Yeah. I was, you know, eating pretty low amount of calories. I, I can't remember what the lowest I'd got to. Maybe eighteen hundred calories, uh, probably less than a maybe less than 10 calories per pound of body weight which yep. would, I don't know what that equates to in kilos. Maybe five, um, or or six, and um, or sorry, double that. And, uh, and yeah, so I remember I was talking about how my, how I'd started to actually develop a taste for fruits and vegetables. Mm. I can taste the sweetness a lot more. Um, mm. you know, just simply due to the fact that I was eating so, such low calories, um, I wasn't going to be eating a Snickers bar or uh, a bowl of ice cream. I mean, I could have, but it, it, I chose not to because, you know, I didn't want to be starving. So I remember that, like I was saying, like things like carrots and, Mm. tomatoes are, were, were very amazing. sweet and yeah and I, and I was we were wondering myself and yourself are wondering how would that change when this whole bodybuilding prep was over and how would my appetite change and what i've noticed actually is that so, so straight after to be honest it was quite a long competition season it wasn't mm. until november that i actually had uh finished uh, my whole kind of dieting thing and um i i remember i was in new york with um Eric Helms, who he mentioned, mm. um, we we went like shopping the next day. I think just like it's in a super uh, a mall or a shopping center, whatever you call it, and um, and I just ate loads of sweets, like you know those pick and mix where you just yeah. like shovel. Yeah, I, and they're pretty pricey. I think I spent like something like forty dollars on a bag of them. But um, it's been a long time, long time coming though. Yeah, since then, like um, 
you know, I just kind of didn't want to really look at too much vegetables at that point because it was literally all I'd been eating yep. um, and out of necessity more so. And, uh, you know, for a few weeks after that, you know, I still tried to make sure that I was eating well, but just definitely having more foods that I wanted to have, like, you know, basically junk food, sweet. I've got a big sweet tooth. Yep. And, and what I noticed as my body fat, say, crept up and as I just started to eat more of these foods with, with higher calories, more of these sugary foods, et cetera, uh, more, say, palatable foods mm. um, or highly palatable foods, mm. that uh, my my appetite definitely changed. Or my, mm. sorry, not my appetite, my 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 taste actually mm. changed. My taste for certain foods actually changed. And, and around Christmas time, I would say, was probably where my diet was, I would say, the worst or basically just more full of junk food, etc. And not nowhere near as much vegetables and fruit that I had been eating. Um, I've kind of tried to, to, you know, fix that over the last month or two. Um, but I noticed that my, my the, the, you know, I no longer found things like pineapple even that sweet anymore. <laughs> you yeah. know which is crazy when you think about it yeah, yeah. so it, it's a it's amazing how the foods that you eat can affect the actual your 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 taste you know yeah. how i'm not sure what your what the glands are that taste i think it's in your tongue right i'm not 100 percent sure I can't yeah remember. i mean um, a, a appetite is just so incredibly developed to seek out nutrients and the nutrients it needs at that point in time so at the moment at that time you were just needing energy and calories and energy dense foods so once you basically tell it that hey, uh, you know, it, it, winter's coming and you need to prepare and add body fat and the foods are available. Your body just goes, let's go, let's keep going and let's not stop because I remember starving and I don't want to be there anymore. And, uh, yeah, it's just a, an amazing defense mechanism to keep you having adequate body weight to not starve. Yeah, and it's... Uh... It is pretty interesting. I mean, because now that or now or I'd say like not too long ago, maybe a month or two ago, I was pretty heavy body weight for for what I'm used to. I mean, in mm. terms of my whole life so far, I've, like the, the higher end of what I've been at, and I noticed that massively. What happened was that my my hunger and my desire to eat, say hyper palatable foods or junk foods, started to you know taper off quite yeah. significantly, and now I can actually go hours without eating at all like i, I had mm. some breakfast there it's it's morning my time but but a lot of times i wouldn't eat breakfast i'd have a co- an espresso coffee and then just uh you know not eat for a while unless mm. i just had a shake because mm. i wanted to get protein in but before that wouldn't have been you know that wouldn't happen at all i'd wake up starving and couldn't wait until my next meal as i was eating the current meal you know so <laughs> um so it, it, yeah it's definitely pretty interesting how that's kind of whole body fat set point theory works where you know your your natural defenses when you're getting too heavy they're just mm. down regulate hunger down regulate the pleasure that you'll get from certain foods um and now i'm actually getting you know more pleasure from eating uh more fruits and vegetables again yeah. and this is something that we kind of want to talk about today yeah. specifically was uh, foods for fat loss and i know yeah. that's not really a, it's more of a, a bro term or kind of a clickbait <laughs> term but you know h- how do you set up your diet so that you can actually sustain say you can actually lose body fat sustainably without starving yourself to death or else maintain uh, a somewhat level of leanness without not not in the bodybuilding sense but you know whatever that is for you and then you maintain that true diet and not having to feel like you're constantly trying to cut calories or constantly trying to go through uh, cutting and a bulking or, or whatever kind of phase it is yeah. and um, i don't know that's something that you've you know yeah. been passionate about you write about it a lot and uh it would be pretty interesting to hear uh some of the things that um you know your thoughts on that yeah yeah it's been i suppose it's been fascinating to to think that you know the bodybuilding scene they're happy to track the calories and log everything in my fitness pal or chronometer for years on end but you know 99.5 percent of the population aren't going to be able to do that and especially the obese diabetic people they just you know that's not something they're able to put that discipline into and then even if most people do they can't do it for a long time because their appetite just drives them to eat more than that you know 1800 calories a day or whatever that magic calculator is set them to so that's sort of been my question of you know how do we dial in our food how do we optimize our food choices to say if you want to gain more weight or you want to recover or get more energy and if you're an athlete then what foods do you choose and how do you dial those in and 
and conversely if you're trying to lose weight really quickly what do you do and yeah it's been really fun to um have a whole pile of data as a as a data nerd to dive in and ask those questions of the data and cut through all the the bro science and all the dietary dogma to find out what what does really help and what leads to greater satiety or, or at least you know what that means is being fuller eating less um with less hunger and and what foods sort of trigger that like that binge instinct that you were talking about and how we can reverse that and there's a whole different ways to look at it and they're all all, all really fascinating so yeah where, where do you want to start yeah. what do you want to talk about well yeah just to put this into context i guess so like I said, there's not specific foods for fat loss like that are going to make you lose fat by eating no. those foods. And and I don't know if you'd listened to it. I think it was before I actually had officially started this podcast. I interviewed the guy um, called Anthony Crow. I can't remember his, his full name, but uh, he, his, his Instagram name was Abs and Ice Cream. And yeah. he did this blog thing for, I think it was 100 days, yep. where he only ate ice cream um like and it wasn't this like you know arctic zero or you know halo top ice cream it was ben and jerry's ice cream and uh yeah and uh and he had whey protein and then he also consumed small amounts of alcohol so whiskey beer and that's all he consumed for 100 days and he lost 30 pounds and uh it was really fascinating to to see uh you know to see his transformation i mean it wasn't uh, you know miraculous transformation he didn't become jacked or shredded but he lost 30 he lost 30 pounds of of, of weight of body fat yeah, and yeah. uh but but having talked to him he was telling me how how awful he felt because just the lack of micronutrients the lack yeah. of fiber yeah. um you know just just you're starting to creep into these deficiencies he started to just have zero motivation to train zero motivation to do anything um he was just feeling sluggish and tired all the yeah. time and he said it was actually really really hard yeah. um and it, for some people you know say, saying like oh you can i can diet on ice cream it sounds awesome but like yeah you can diet on ice cream but you, you can, can only eat a, do you like, really want to yeah yeah you can eat a pint of ice cream per day and that's it you know nothing else you know or whatever whatever it is so yeah, people think a, well, i can diet on ice a, cream plus there's a twinkies diet where the dude did you know a certain amount of twinkies and you lose weight sure because you're limiting your calories but you know your body if you're feeding it those sorts of foods it's going to want to eat more so it's this massive constant fight with your appetite and i think the general population need to find foods that will tame the appetite so they're not you know back in the fridge at 10 o'clock at night trying to polish everything off because they're still starving and and for most people the appetite governs and once their drive for food says i've had enough you stop eating and until then you you keep eating and that's just the way we all sort of function and survive so i I really think there are a lot of parameters in our food that we can understand and we can manage and quantitatively dial in to uh to, to to give us a better chance of not having to fight with our appetite all the time yeah so i guess like when we're talking about setting up a diet or, or certain foods for fat loss what what we mean is making it as easy and sustainable as possible yeah. so that you're you're feeling either more energetic or or else at least you're not you're 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 mitigating any kind of negative effects of a diet or as much as you possibly can beyond the yeah. kind of biological changes that would happen so i guess the first thing we would start or or we can start on is is satiety so yeah. would you would you mind explain a little bit about satiety how different foods affect satiety what satiety actually even means for those who perhaps don't yeah. understand so as you sort of mentioned before satiety is that you know feeling full with more or less calories so satiating foods you're not craving more food later on with the same sort of amount of calories so from a macro point of view we we crunched the numbers on half a million days of my fitness pal data and basically found that a higher protein percentage tends to lead to greater satiety and more fiber they're both positive indicators of satiety but it's it's protein percentage not protein quantity because if you just eat more protein usually it comes with a whole lot more fat and i think um in your last podcast with jackson pios he was talking about you know um uh, viscosity and you know just eating more protein doesn't do it you have to sort of dial back the fat and carbohydrate in your protein source to the point that you get a higher percentage of protein and and that just seems to have the greatest 
driver of overall satiety and, and not craving more food. So yeah, and we see the same thing in the master classes that we run as people dial back the fat and carbohydrate and end up with a higher percentage of protein. They just go, yeah, I'm not hungry anymore. I feel energized and I feel good and I don't crave food, especially when you throw all the other micronutrients in there with the fiber and, and vegetables or whatever else comes with that. It's not just, you know, eat chicken breast and egg whites. It's, it's get the protein with the other nutrient dense foods together as sort of the secret. Yeah. So, so what you mean basically is not just adding more protein on top of what you're currently eating, but still within that context of, you know, the calories will drive and um, regardless if you're tracking them yeah. or not calories will drive your, your body weight. So, and um, the percentage yeah. of your diet coming from protein should be increased if you're not consuming, say, a considerable or enough protein i guess uh, anyway so like i think general recommendations yeah. for for protein are, are probably different based on the country that you're in but i know that they're largely based off just not losing muscle so i think it's something like yeah. 0.8 grams per kilogram in ireland which is you know really it would be like you know eight, less than 80 grams for me which you know i, I don't know if I even maintain my muscle on that maybe i would but i don't know if that's optimal for, for but, body composition but that's the minimum to prevent prevent diseases of dis deficiency yeah. but you know optimal is often a lot more than that and people actually do better on on greater absolute amounts of protein but yeah it's it's the percentage of protein so dialing back those other easy energies so it, it it in the end it comes down to what's the easiest energy source for your body and your body loves refined fat and refined carbohydrate and when you put those together you basically get a donut or a croissant or anything that's modern junk food so everything's basically you can think of it as a spectrum from croissant and donut down to egg white and broccoli and and spinach at the other other end of the spectrum or you know i love to eat kangaroo which is 80 percent protein and really lean and it just smashes the the hunger and you're really full and yeah, so that, that's sort of the, you think of it on a spectrum and if you want to dial back your appetite, then focus on those higher fi fibre, higher percentage protein foods. Yeah, so for, for people who don't know, um, you know, maybe it's a good idea to explain where, where you live because I've never seen kangaroo meat in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in Brisbane, Australia and um, kangaroo is basically a pest here and they're all dominate the farms and they they're you know they're on the national emblem but they also end up in the supermarket because they're a, a a pest that is culled and the meat is used for humans and dogs and uh, i really like it and because it's so um wild effectively it's in its natural environment eating natural food getting plenty of vitamin d and moving around that the nutrient density of this you know kangaroo meat and basically any other wild game meat is just incredibly off the chart. So it's not just the protein, but you're getting all these other nutrients with it that are highly beneficial to satiety in a whole range of different ways. So like you said, you, you're not just eating the, the, the Ben and Jerry's, you're eating food that nourishes your body. So your body says, yeah, I've got what I need. I don't need to keep on seeking more energy, more nutrients uh, until I get enough. And, you know, uh, you might've heard the protein leverage, the uh, protein leverage hypothesis that you basically all creatures whether they be you know, insects or animals or ourselves we eat enough food to get the protein and minerals and other micronutrients we need and if you can you know manage your calories so you get the, the micronutrients per calorie you, you need to eat less calories so that just seems to be the the ultimate way to, to picture satiety is to find the foods that contain enough or well, more micronutrients per calorie yeah that, that's very interesting and w w i suppose going back to the kind of macronutrients w what are some of the other mm. effects that we see with, with fat and carbohydrates so protein being the, the most satiating macronutrient mm. w what's the kind of data that you've seen on on fat and and carbohydrates and, and then fiber if you yeah. want to include that as well yeah, they're basically, oh, fiber has a positive benefit, but you can only get so much fiber in your diet. You know, you, you, you can get a high percentage of protein. You might be able to get 60% of protein in your diet, but you can only really get up to 5 or 10% protein in your, uh, fiber in your diet. So you can't get a really big leverage effect from the fiber, but it is beneficial. But on the other end, 
basically easy energy. You can think of it as dietary induced thermogenesis, that fat is has a very low dietary induced thermogenesis, meaning that it, it doesn't take much energy to use in your body or to store in your body. And there's basically infinite amount of storage capacity in your body for fat. And there's um, you know a little bit less, maybe 2000 calories per day of storage capacity in glycogen for carbohydrate. Um, and then not a lot of storage capacity for, for protein. So um, you need enough protein, but you know, if if you're low on glycogen, your body's going to go, yeah, give me one of those cookies. And if you're you know if you're low on fat, like you found yourself, you're going to be just craving anything. And the best way to get energy in quickly, if you're a caveman trying to refeed after a a, a, a famine or a or a bodybuilder after a eight weeks eight months of um, preparation and and being at the body fat you're at it, it's that carbohydrate and fat together that's highly refined that just you know your body just goes yeah i love this because it's going to store fat really really quickly so um, not only do you want to eat more of it more of it is actually um, turned into energy and able to be stored on your body just because it's so um, available it's bioavailable to your body to be used and stored really easily whereas protein has got a 25 percent ish dietary induced thermogenesis so if you want to turn that into atp your body just goes nah i'd rather not have to turn the protein into atp can you give me some of that you know ben and jerry's things that'd be great it's so much easier to use in my body or store as fat yeah so essentially like on a on a calorie per calorie or a gram per gram basis protein mm is is basically needs to go through more steps for it to be able yeah. to create energy than than Definitely. fat and carbs so if you're just to replace a certain amount of um a certain amount of calories with just more protein and and it's actually a strategy i deal with the, some clients that i work with because they're not all bodybuilders and, and tracking like you said isn't isn't something that's for everybody even for me i mm. I, I don't track anymore i haven't done it mm. since I, I stopped competing and it's not because I think it's bad. I just think it's a tool that's used at a certain period, to, you know, for certain people. And um, mm. if I was to diet again now, maybe I wanted to get a better hold of my diet. I might track for a week to see kind of what mm. I'm consuming. But I think simply just adding in more protein. Um, mm. Typically, when you tell someone to add in more protein into their diet, that that is say not consuming enough, or let's say in the in the the bodybuilding or or muscle building world, you know, probably around two grams per kilogram, mm. you know, at, at, at minimum, if you're not consuming that much, simply by telling them to just consume more protein, you default to just eating a little bit less fats, a little bit less carbs mm. because of that satiety mm. effect. And because of this kind of thermic effect of food, basically the, the energy needed to burn the calories or the to, to break down the food, um, you could end up actually losing a little bit more weight. I don't know if it's noticeable, mm. but by eating more protein and even if the calories were, were the same, right? Yeah, but then once that eating more sirloin steak starts to not give you satiety and you start to stall out, then you need to go, hey, what's a, a less fatty cut of meat that I'm getting still the protein but less fat along with my protein? So fat always comes with protein you know, pretty much all the time unless you're eating egg whites or, or protein powder. But you just need to, to, to choose less and less fatty cuts of meat as you're trying to get leaner and leaner. So... Um, we basically use a pro process where you just continue to dial it down based on your progress. And if you stop losing it half to 1% per week, then you can just keep on dialing that fat and carbohydrate back in your diet until you essentially get to a protein spring modified fast. But usually most people don't need to go to that extreme to get results. Yeah, and not, yeah, that, that makes complete sense. And um, mm. you had this kind of, idea or i don't know if it's a theory um but it's called you know don't eat for winter can you talk a, a little <laughs> bit about that yeah yeah um a mate of mine sian foley from uh, ireland as well a fascinating guy and uh he just made this observation that the foods available in autumn leading up to winter are, are generally these you know combination of fat and carbs that are very very rare in nature um maybe nuts or or you know breast milk or and it's as if these sorts of foods trigger uh, that binge instinct that you're talking about before that once you give your body those foods it's basically signaling that winter's coming and you need to 
prepare for that impending winter where you need enough fat on your body to survive potentially a famine and then from a cyclical point of view you sort of go into a low carb keto sort of winter where there's less carbs available and you've got plenty of fatty meat from the animals that have also gained fat and then you you come into a spring where it comes to a sort of a, a protein spring modified fast where you've got lean animals and, and lots of fibrous veggies around and you lose the fat and then go into to summer and then go into autumn again so whether you believe in that being you know the the hormonal way it works it just seems to be a an interesting and useful way of thinking about it that um you know when you feed anybody uh, we've done a lot of experiments in mice and they see that when they feed them these combinations of fat and carb they go into what's called hyperphagia where they just you know that's basically what eric helms or yourself talks about after the after the competition you just can't stop eating you can't stop thinking of food anybody who gets really lean just keeps on wanting to eat and and if you present those foods to people they're much more likely to keep on eating but at the other extreme if you if you try to drop those foods back out if you're not trying to diet on the ben and jerry's but rather the you know egg white and, and lean meats and and non-starchy veggies then you're going to find it much easier to, to drop weight and not be possessed with food while still getting all the micronutrients you need at the same time yeah i, I remember reading uh something as a blog post or, or a book by stefan guillene mm. around some of the some of the effects that certain combinations of foods would have and that when we you know traditionally when and even still today in in some tribes in africa they when they come across certain foods that may they may only come across sparingly mm. they would they would binge on that so mm. there was a i can't remember the name of the tribe but they they were known to eat you know like 20 oranges in one sitting which just <laughs> sounds absurd um but it's not like they would eat 20 oranges every single day mm. but then when you think about us living in the yep. Western world yep. with a cupboard, cupboards full of food, you know, this is at our, at our whim all, all the time, these, these highly palatable, highly dense foods. And, you know, certain combinations, I remember reading a, a paper on um, ad libitum uh, consumption of, of food based mm. off of this, you, the perceived palatability or perceived mm. pleasantness from certain foods. And those who had a i think i think i think it was a 10 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10 palatability uh, versus those who only had a, a 6 or a, you know a median or a medium sorry palatability mm. in a buffet setting or whatever based off the foods they're eating those who actually consumed more palatable foods or, or perceived it to be more tasty mm. ate something like 30 percent more calories until they were full mm. so it's actually a strategy that i try and implement myself you know even if i am like tracking calories i think you can still even in the context of tracking your calories you can still make this easier for yourself mm. to not to not try and go against your willpower or mm. to go against your natural instincts Definitely. or urges so when i i remember i i actually been eating it pretty lately this protein bar from my protein i don't know if you, you get my protein down there but um it's it's like a brick and it's not that <laughs> tasty i mean it's okay it's i can eat it but it's not that tasty but yeah. i know if i just bought the most tasty protein bars that i like whatever that is or if yeah, i yeah. bought something else that i, re I you know i'd find it hard not to eat like a few of them a day rather than just the, eating one like every day or every gone. second day yeah exactly yeah, but, but, but everything in our food environment at the moment is a combination of refined starches sugars and um you know vegetable oils with a whole lot of uh, flavorings and colorings to make it look like it's nutritious but it's not so we're just in this extreme hyper palatable zone that then our taste buds are so a bliss point for our taste buds have been wound up to 20 and then the the chicken and broccoli and and like foods that should taste amazing because they've got, a, got nutrients in them taste really bland and boring so we don't have that taste but at the same time if you're you know if if your normal natural food tastes like crap then you probably need to go in search uh, a maybe dial back the the really processed food but b seek out the foods that are grown you know closely in connection with nature in a happy environment your your plants that are in nutrient dense soil with a whole lot of micronutrients and uh you know m healthy microbiome grown in in close proximity to animals and everything with a, a regenerative sort of environment and you're going to get 
much tastier, much more nutritious, much enjoyable, more enjoyable food that you're going to love eating. That you you're not going to miss the uh, you know the donut and cookies because you know they may taste okay for a little while, but then later on you go, yeah, I feel like crap, and that really wasn't worth it. And I know how much better yeah. I feel when I eat these other foods that are actually good for me because they contain the nutrients I need. Yeah, and I think um, from my own experience, just anecdotally, the way I said that after this competition, I started to lose a taste for fruits and vegetables or the sweetness. I was I was just almost forcing myself to eat them because I knew that I they're part of a healthy diet. Mm. But but now that I started to, it's not that I ever ha- didn't have them, but now that I'm starting to eat more, um, I, and and trying to move away from say more highly refined, highly palatable foods, mm. I'm actually getting this taste back again. So I, I don't think it's I think it's pretty uh, pretty well researched to show how, how your your palate can change. I know mm. this, they've done this with babies. I don't think babies actually develop a taste for salt until they're a certain age, and yeah. they've actually had salt introduced into their diet. Mm. Um, and I, I notice you, you might notice yourself or experience this that some people um, put a load of salt in their food, mm. and others that they, that they live with, like my girlfriend, puts a load of salt in her food, and I'm like, wow, that's really salty. <laughs> but it's just you, you, you. It's like a homeostasis. Um, yeah. You know taste i guess where it's the, the more you add you actually just get used to that and as you slowly bring that down um you, you just basically adapt to it so that's mm-hmm. been something that i've been trying to do and and like i said with the highly palatable things that what i advise people to do is um that have trouble with say overeating a lot or, or can't stop themselves instead of just saying you know uh you know you've no willpower or whatever i'd say try and try and have foods that you like but you don't mm. love all the time you know so mm. like that's the kind of strategy that i try and implement where you know i love eating reese's peanut butter cups but i don't try and buy them too often because because i love them and it's it it, it goes against this kind of idea of this iifym flexible dieting where it's like if you fit whatever you want into your diet as long as you're yeah. within as your calories way and measure everything you ever eat for the rest of your life it works yeah. perfectly <laughs> and you know to be honest it can work but even if you do that you, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be str- struggling to fight some of the urges where well, yeah. you can make this a lot easier you can um, just make it a whole, for yourself yeah, exactly and you've got to think i like to think if you've got to feed your in a lizard you've got to feed your in a reptile you've got to feed your body with What's what, with, it, what with it needs. the re- reptile flakes and the and the pet store <laughs> no but you, you've got this inner in a lizard brain that that makes sure you stay alive and if you give it uh, if you tell it there's a famine and there's tell it tell it there's no good food around it's going to crave uh, you know whatever it can get and it's going to prepare for a famine by gaining more fat but if you actually give it the nutrients it needs it goes oh yeah that's what i really need i don't need to store this fat for winter so yeah it, it sounds a bit woo woo but you know the the data and our analysis just lines up with it really nicely that if you give your body the micronutrients it needs then your appetite settles down you don't need to be weighing and measuring everything or you go oh yeah i'm under my calorie intake well, and oh yeah i've gone over 2000 and i was only allowed 1800 today and tomorrow i'll have to cut back and it's this continual guilt mm. perpetual cycle if you can actually think of food as nourishing your body and giving your body what it actually needs it, it takes away that that guilt rather than restriction you're going well let's seek out foods that my body actually needs to thrive and do well and lift stronger lift lift more and run faster and think better and live longer and really all those the the micronutrients is what powers your your mitochondria and all your bodily functions your immune system which is incredibly important at the moment and yeah so if you're not giving your body what it needs it's going to keep on seeking out more food in an effort to a store more fat for the, the pending emergency but b to get the nutrients it does need from food no matter how many calories it needs to plow through to get those nutrients yeah and i think in the context of overall evolution and how long humans have been on the earth the last 100 200 years or you know particularly probably since the say 50s 60s 70s the 1950s that you know that's such a small time frame that this our our diet has changed or access To, yeah. and and economy has changed to where we can have basically unlimited access to calories yeah. and highly palatable calories so it, it does make sense that our, you know evolution takes you know millions of years i'm not 100 percent sure how long humans have been on the earth but <laughs> i know that you know it, maybe in 
two thousand years, we may have adapted to be um more in tune with um eating these more highly palatable foods. I don't know. Maybe we'll be all dead from obesity <laughs> obesity related disease. But I don't. I don't. I'm not sure. But it it does make sense. Yeah. But when you talk to we talked a little bit about the the macronutrients, proteins, carbs, mm. and fats, and how they affect society. But what about specific micronutrients, the, like your vitamins and minerals? Can they have an impact on on your hunger? Yeah, we, we um had the 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 pleasure of having sixty thousand days of data from optimizers, which are people who we've got their chronometer data uploaded to the nutrient optimizer, and I, I said, you know, let's plot this in terms of um calorie intake versus uh, divided by basal metabolic rate versus um, nutrients per calorie so we can develop a relationship to understand uh, at what point do you get enough of different micronutrients and that has a positive effect on your satiety so yes that's been fascinating and you mentioned sodium before there's sort of a point where you get enough salt and your body goes yeah i've had enough of, at about four or five grams per two thousand calories potassium is really powerful um, all the micronu- all the minerals like are quite powerful. All the amino acids have a really powerful effect on satiety. So the more of the, each of those you get per calorie, the greater it is. Um, and then with the vitamins, uh, we see definitely you get greater satiety when you're getting a good amount more than the minimum recommended to prevent disease. But you can also see that when you get to the point where people are obviously just supplementing with you know, thiamine or, or B3 supplements, that sort of starts to plateau out. So we can identify sort of an optimal nutrient intake that is achievable with food where that beneficial um, impact seems to stop and we stop craving those extra nutrients from that food. So that, that's been fascinating and, you know, protein percentage definitely has the greatest effect, but foods that contain these other micronutrients definitely have a, a very powerful effect. But it's not just the... You can't just get it in a bottle. It it, it it seems to come from the 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 nutrients that are wrapped up in the matrix with all the other beneficial and synergistic synergistic nutrients at the same time. Yeah, it would be interesting to see. Um, you know, you know, obviously we, we don't eat a certain micronutrients in isolation mm. unless you supplement them. Supplement with them, but it seems like you know taking a multivitamin wouldn't actually cover this off because it's mm. it's not just the, the the micronutrient by itself but the, like you said within the context of the other things like Definitely. the fiber the, the food volume um yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's that's pretty interesting and, and i yeah. wonder if you it, you know if you could separate that the, the actual other properties of the the foods that are high in these could, could we still see a difference is that something that you look at it was yeah, probably not impossible we, we sort of um wound it up but did, did a chart of different micronutrients and to see how powerful each of those micro, micronutrients are on satiety and identified the the most powerful ones and even like omega-3 we tend to crave more omega-3 containing foods and similarly with cholesterol cholesterol serves important functions in the body but then um, you know once we get enough fat overall we just keep eating more and more our appetite doesn't settle down we just go yeah I'll give me more of that energy um, but yeah it's 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 a it's a really fascinating thing it's really you know we've sort of scratched the surface and it's been fun to um, try and say okay how can we use this to develop you know optimal food lists for different goals and recipes and recipe books which has been a blast so yeah Yeah, yeah. Some people talk about viscosity. Jackson Peels on your last podcast talked about that, and I suppose that there are some studies that show that. But at the same time, it's hard to quantify the viscosity. There's not a USDA database showing viscosity. Um, there was some previous work by Barbara Rolls looking at food volume volumetrics, but at the same time, it's hard to separate that from. Um, which foods contain more fiber and it seems to be really more related to fiber and and water content but um, the, it's more the dry weight that seems to be a, a beneficial thing so um, once you dry it out what's what's the weight of that food um, and if you're drinking your calories 
you know y your coke is not going to be sat satiating per calorie at all so yeah basically don't drink your calories in the form of you know calorie containing soft drinks or alcohol or whatever because there's really very low satiety value and from a from an alcohol um yeah alcohol is interesting uh over a, over a certain point there does seem to be a, a satiety effect because basically your body has to burn it off really quickly and it shuts down everything else and says i've got to burn this off and yeah like protein will have a, a quite a high dietary induced thermogenesis but alcohol has an even greater um, thermogenic effect because your body just has to ramp up the metabolism to get rid of it really quickly but but at that point you're probably hammered <laughs> You probably passed out, so you can't eat anything more anyway. But uh, but at the yeah. at the same time, from beer and wine, it's amazing how many calories people polish off on that. So um, yeah, and the nutrient content yeah. of vodka, unfortunately, is not not very high. So don't don't expect to get your nutrients from vodka. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's probably interesting when you look at it mechanistically, but it doesn't have any. I wouldn't say it has any practical applications if you're actually trying to lose weight. It can actively trying yeah. to drink more alcohol probably isn't the best strategy yeah, yeah. And, and you get that point of dis, dis inhibition that you just go out and eat everything else in sight and you, <laughs> you know, screw the calorie yeah. count and the, my fitness yeah. pal today i'll just forget that and have everything else that's, that's available to me so yeah generally alcohol doesn't have a positive overall satiety effect that's um yeah that's probably the, the biggest i'd say problem i would say with people trying to lose fat and drinking alcohol because most people, do, well, a lot of people do like to drink anyway, but it's not the, the alcohol necessarily itself, but it's the, the disinhibition or the next day where you're sluggish and you're just, you don't mm. move. And then you're like, well, I just gonna, I'm going to order a pizza or, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, I prep I meals like there, crap. but me, I just don't, that. I don't feel like eating that. Yeah. You just crave really bad foods when you feel that bad. But if you feel energized and well slept, you're going to crave much healthier foods that are better for you. <laughs> Mm. And the vo the volume metrics or the, the food volume itself is, is actually pretty interesting. And like you said, it is very difficult to separate food volume mm. uh, with, with, uh, with, you know, highly nutrient dense foods, because most high food, mm. most foods that are high in, in volume are fruits and vegetables, which are also high in fiber, high in micronutrients, but actually yeah. making this, uh, I was making this kind of protein fluff for a, g a good while yeah. during my, my yeah, contest yeah, yeah. prep. I, I don't know how nutrient, oh, I had protein in, I guess, and actually frozen strawberries. But but, yeah, but but with xanthan gum, I'm not sure if that's a fiber. It's a thickening agent for sure. Yeah, it probably would be. Uh, yeah. So that was like super, super filling um, because it was just so much food. And I think there's, there's something to say for the physical uh, aspect of, uh, I was reading some paper on, uh, you know different different pathways to satiation mm. uh, or satiety and uh, so there's something to say for the, actually the, the expanding of your stomach and how that can actually yeah, affect definitely. your brain so if you can fill your fill but your that stomach can be up, quite but... a, that that's definitely an effect but it's sort of a short-term effect and once that that has gone you're hungry again so that, that some people have to use glucomannan powder which sort of you know and, and some magic noodles that sort of expand in your stomach and yeah, once you drink some water with it, you get very full um, and you don't mm. feel like eating anymore. But whether it gives you the nutrients and protein that your body needs for the long term and says, yeah, I've got, I've got enough nutrition that I need to not eat any more food is another matter. Whether it's a, a long-term effect, I'm not sure. Yeah, that is, that is pretty interesting. And I think by doing strategies like that where you have these foods that expand inside your stomach and even the things that I, I was eating, uh, they don't give you the best uh, gastric digestion you know you get you, <laughs> yeah you start you start to make some noises yeah, definitely. uh that you don't normally yeah, do you're, not, you're um, not so popular with your girlfriend anymore no so uh so, so I, I guess one of the biggest things that people they they struggle with is is when they're trying to say lose weight and and we, we've been touching on as well is, is trying to eat more mm. uh say nutrient dense foods more say mm. tip, you know your traditional healthy foods but but a lot of people mm. don't really still understand or don't understand why they they're not losing weight when they're eating these healthy foods so it, you know they might make a salad and, and i remember i used to a long time ago when i was doing my first bodybuilding prep i, I remember in january people who i worked with in the office we had a, a canteen this was like subsidized canteen they would they would all, always or often mm. switch 
they'd be say eating a, a, a sandwich once a day with whatever ham and cheese or whatever was on it and then in january come january yeah. everybody would be on this health kind of buzz which traditionally yeah. or typically would mean weight loss and uh and, and they would switch these salads which yes very high yeah. in nutrient dense foods but it would be, yep. you know, almost double the calories of the the actual sandwich because they <laughs> had all this, you know, they had this quinoa, oil. sweet mm. potatoes, oils, some dressings as well. So, h- yeah. h- how would you actually, how do you give advice to people who are who are looking to try and you know optimize their nutrition, but also not, uh, you know, get get gain any more weight or or maybe in in, in conjunction with uh, optimizing their nutrition, they want to also lose weight. Yeah, I suppose that's where a point where tracking can be useful. If you do track your food and say, where am I getting my my fat and my my non fiber carbohydrates from, and go, how do I cut those back, and how do I increase where I'm getting my fiber and my protein from? Because those salads are going to fill you up for the short term, but later on at night, if you didn't get the protein and you know, the filling satiating foods you're going to be raiding the fridge so you might be eating that salad with your mates at lunchtime at work but you're probably raiding the fridge or ordering pizza when you get home because you're you're famished because they're not actually satiating over the long term but um yeah definitely look to to cut back both the fat and the carbohydrate and up the fiber and the percentage of protein by cutting back the the fat and carbohydrate um, and then looking to prioritize nutrient dense foods, which are the the leaner proteins, the seafood, the the non starchy green veggies. Like you said, sometimes the the carrot or whatever can can fill you up as well. Um, even a you know plain potato is 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 quite filling by itself as long as you don't start adding a whole lot of oil to it. Yeah. So, did you find that there's any specific foods? Um, that are really highly satiating that people wouldn't necessarily think of. Um, yeah, just just the 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 the, the cod, the, uh, the 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 prawns, and and the, the the leaner seafood. Maybe not the salmon if you're trying to really go hard. Um, but it, and and just the leaner cuts of meat, the the leaner beef, um, the egg whites. Those sorts of things are gonna. If you try to add more of those foods into your diet, you're gonna be satiated and not be craving those other foods and any non-starchy veggies the the spinach the asparagus um you know anything that's fresh and and green and and uh you know maybe that the, the sweet potato or the potato if you're adding a bunch of oil to it it's not going to help but that could be part of the journey as long as you're not throwing a whole lot of oil to, together because as we mentioned before once you add um fat and carbohydrate you basically get the potato chip or the the the, uh, the the cheesecake once you bring those together and it has a really you know hyper palatable you know, give me more of that sort of sensation yeah and I, and I think we just touched on it a moment ago was uh, tracking at some point and I think like you said if somebody um, feels like they should be progressing or aren't progressing as, as much as or as predicted as as they would like then mm. uh, even just tracking for a week or some some, some mm. form of food log where you, you actually take a, a proper um you know objective view of what you're actually eating and most people find that they're actually eating a lot more calories than, yeah. than what they think and it's yeah. not just about trying to add more fruits and vegetables you know by uh, you know by default this often means that you will consume less other foods or less of other yeah. say highly palatable foods but if you just start throwing these foods in on top of your 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 chocolate cake or whatever um and you're just consuming excess calories then you're not mm-hmm. going to be seeing progress right the nutrient dense meals if you prioritize them are really you know big bulky uh, f- plates of food without too much energy which is quite surprising once you actually dial that in yeah um yeah it's, it's really interesting and i know you've got a lot more work on your website and you've got tons and tons of articles and resources uh on your on your website the name is optimizingnutrition.com yep yep and we've got also nutrient optimizer where people can jump on and and find which foods and meals will help them uh dial in their nutrient density and satiety so we've got a a seven day tracking challenge thing where people can just like we're talking about track their food for a little while and find out which foods uh, which nutrients they're missing and therefore which foods they need to eat more of to get those nutrients and based on the goal whether it be weight loss or you know 
bodybuilding or whatever that goal may be, we can dial it in and, and just say these are the foods and meals that will help you move towards your goal. And I know that you have got some, or have released some new books online, right? Covering all different yeah. uh, types of diets and different goals. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So we went, we basically said the way to show people uh, what nutrient density is and how we can optimize it for different goals is just to simplify it by creating the most nutritious, you know, weight loss meals or plant based meals or keto meals. And let's show you what nutrient density looks like in this form. So the photos just came out amazing and we ended up creating 22 different books for different goals. So, yeah, but most people listening to this they probably want the fat loss or the bodybuilding sort of approach. Um, but we've dialed it in for for cancer and, and vegetarian and plant-based just to maximize nutrient density on each of those approaches. Awesome. So I'll link those all in the show notes for anybody listening. And uh, and what's the best place be for people to contact you, Marty? Yeah, um, probably on Facebook, Optimizing Nutrition. Um, you'll find me somewhere. And yeah, I love to hear from people and uh, love the feedback and uh, get involved and share the journey. Yeah, looking forward to bringing optimizing nutrition and nutritional optimization to to more people who who seem to really need it at the moment all right so i hope you enjoyed the episode with myself and marty and you took some things away from it people often overlook the nuances in nutrition while you do want to keep it simple it's not always just about creating a calorie deficit one if you want to make your fat loss approach as easy as possible and two to make it as healthy and sustainable as possible so if you want to find out more about marty you can check out some of his work Um, and links again are in the show notes and you can you can get some of his ebooks that are linked in the show notes as well you can have a look at those he has a ton of different ebooks that really well developed put together i've had a look through them all and if you want to reach me you can always get me at my email it's in the show notes or you can get me on instagram it's probably the best place to get me and that's adam at adamac192 but with that being said i wish you well and i will chat